Welcome uh, to the 31st celebration of the Congressional Art Competition. Congratulations to this year's winners. My name is Mark Strand, and I'm the president of the Congressional Institute. Uh, the Congressional Institute is proud to sponsor the Congressional Art Competition again this year. This is the ninth year we've been involved in this uh, uh, program that was originally approved by an act of Congress. Uh, from the beginning of our republic, our leaders have understood the importance of arts. In fact, George Washington himself wrote that to encourage literature and the arts is a duty to which every good citizen owes his country. Well, over two centuries later, you, the winners of the 2012 Congressional Art Competition, take your place among thousands of other good citizens who have enriched our country with your art. We could not be happy to recognize your talents and your contributions to American culture. It's important to put in perspective how great an honor your country is bestowing on you by having your pictures hang in the halls of the Capitol. Even each state is limited to only two statues that can be placed in the Capitol building, and every other major painting and statues must be approved by an act of Congress before they can hang in the Capitol. So this is not an honor to be taken lightly. And besides the millions of visitors to our Capitol who will see your artwork, the House of Representatives will run an online gallery of your paintings on the front page of the House's website so the rest of the world can see your good work too. Tens of millions of people visit this website every year and will now have the opportunity to see your work. Uh, so I want to thank the people who make the exhibit of your artwork possible. The curator of the Capitol, Dr. Barbara Wollenin, and her staff had a monumental task of caring for and hanging the artwork. And once you see the Cannon Tunnel, you will appreciate what an undertaking that is. Also, Mr. Stephen Ayers, the architect of the Capitol, and Mr. William Woodermer, the House Superintendent, and their staffs have been tremendously helpful in preparing the exhibit as well. This year is the best participation level we have ever seen. Of the 441 House offices, 407 have participated and are represented here today. Something this big does not happen by itself. The massive undertaking would not have been possible had it not been for the hard work of several other people. Jordan Cook with Congressman Tim Griffin's office and Ashley Dior Thomas from Congressman Hanson Clark's office have worked tirelessly and very effectively to organize this national program. And I'd also like to recognize Dan Risco and particularly Tim Lang of the Congressional Institute who put many hours of hard work to make this day possible. I stand in awe of your talent and courage in putting your art before the nation. Uh, the great poet Robert Frost said that artists are always believers ahead of your evidence. What was the evidence that I could write a poem, he, he said. I just believed it. The most creative thing in us is to believe art into existence. Well, thank you for believing your art into existence. On behalf of all those involved in this project, congratulations for being a winner in the 2012 Congressional Art Competition. Now it's my pleasure to introduce one of the co-chairs of the Congressional Art Competition, Congressman Hanson Clark. He was elected, oh yeah. he was elected to represent the 13th Congressional District of the U.S. House of Representatives in Michigan in, in November of 2010. The district covers communities near the east side of Detroit. Congressman Clark serves in the House Committee on Homeland Security and the House Committees on Science, Space, and Technology, and is a vice president of the Democrat freshman class. Uh, before coming to Congress, Mr. Clark was elected three times to the Michigan House of Representatives and twice to the Michigan Senate. Uh, born and raised in the 13th Congressional District, Congressman Clark uh, spent most of his life on the Lower East Side of Detroit. As a son of an African-American mother and Indian father, he was exposed to diverse experiences and ways of thinking. Uh, his mother, Thelma Clark, was a school crossing guard, and when his, uh, she raised him as a single parent after his father died at the age of eight. Recognizing that her son had a gift for the arts, Thelma Clark secured private lessons for him at the Detroit Institute of Arts. Based on his artistic talent, Mr. Clark received a scholarship from Cornell University, where he graduated with a degree in fine arts. He later ruined it by getting a law degree from Georgetown Law School. <laughs> it's a deep honor for me to introduce Congressman Clark. Hi, everybody. 
Mark has uh, alluded to the problem in Congress. We have too many lawyers working here. <laughs> we need more artists. Uh, I'm Hanson Clark, U.S. Congressman. I am so proud to be here today. Also, since I am an active legislator, I want to talk to you about some legislating I've been doing. I am the author and the uh, prime sponsor of the Student Loan Forgiveness Act of 2012. <laughs> I want to tell you how a freshman like me was able to come up with an idea to forgive student loans. I used my education. No, not the law degree. I used the fine arts painting degree. Creativity, that's what you really need in this place. If you want to change the system, you've got to imagine the world how you want it to be, how it can be. So that's why I wanted to come here to thank all of you. Each and every one of you, regardless of the medium that you've worked in, and I primarily was, uh, you know, I used to draw and um, went into oil, then acrylic, then watercolor. That's what I use right now, watercolor. But I like line and color, form, and shape. Anyway, I could, get, I could talk to you about that at length. But all of you not only have the technical skill to actually represent what you intend, you actually have the creativity to create the composition. And there's something else that you have that you're likely not aware of. As a matter of fact, since all of you are really great artists in your age for being recognized like this, it'll take other people to see the extraordinary vision that you have in creating your works. See, this is a vision sometimes you're not consciously aware of. You just do it. It just comes to you based on inspiration. But see, it's that kind of vision, though, that can get this world out of war. It's that kind of vision that can bring peace and equality and prosperity, or at least the opportunity, the equal chance that everybody can have that here. So in closing, I wanted to thank all of you as artists, but I also want to thank the parents and family members for being here today. You know, if any of you as parents share some of the same concerns that my mother did about me when I was in my first semester in college, uh, majoring in painting. And this was like one of the last conversations I had with her because she, she passed away a few weeks after that. She said, son, on the phone, what are you really going to do with that art degree? <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is a legitimate concern. Here's what you as artists can tell your parents and adults. I'm working to create a new world and save the world right now so everyone can have a better chance and live in a better place to live. Thank you. God bless you. You can see we have uh, the class of 2010 of members of Congress is one of the most dynamic classes uh, to come into Congress. And you just saw an example of why that's so. Uh, 89 new members of, uh, actually, is 96 new members of the House were elected that year, and they're all young, hard chargers, and don't listen to what you hear about the press. This is a really dynamic group of people, and I, I think you can see by the example of Congressman Clark just how true that is. Uh, my next uh, pleasure is to introduce Congressman Tim Griffin, who was elected from the 24th uh, District. Well, he's in the 2nd District of uh, Arkansas. I remember you don't have 24 districts in Arkansas. 2nd District of uh, Arkansas in 2010. He's also an, a member of the freshman class. He's the youngest son of a minister and teacher. Tim is a fifth generation Arkansan, veteran, attorney, and former small business owner. He lives in Little Rock with his wife, Elizabeth, and their two children. Uh, for the 112th Congress, he's a member on the Armed Services Committee, the Foreign Affairs Committee, and the Judiciary Committee. Uh, Congressman Griffin grew up in Magnolia, where he attended public school before attending Hendricks College in Conway, uh, Tulane Law School in New Orleans, and he even attended Oxford University in England. Congressman Griffin is currently serving in his 16th year as an officer in the U.S. Army Reserve in the JAG Corps, and he holds the rank of major. Uh, in May 2006, uh, Congressman Griffin was assigned to the 101st Airborne Division and sent to serve in Iraq. The Congressman served on the board of the Florence Critten Crittenden Home for Unwed Mothers and the Big Brothers, Big Sisters of Central Arkansas. Uh, join me in welcoming Congressman Tim Griffin. Thank you all so much for uh, letting me be a part of this. I will tell you that uh, 
you hear that there's no bipartisanship up here, but Congressman Clark left me his BlackBerry down there. He trusted me with it the entire time. And that's a big deal in Washington where you live uh, through your BlackBerry. Um, I am proud to be the first representative from Arkansas to co-chair the Congressional Art Competition. As you may have been told, this is the 31st year, uh, and the theme is artistic and artistic discovery. Uh, since 1982, more than 650,000 high school students have participated in this competition. And, uh, you know, when I see the, the smiles on the faces of participants back in uh, Little Rock, particularly the winter, uh, I'm reminded of what an opportunity this is for folks to come up here and to, uh, for many of them, uh, never been to Washington, and some of them, in fact, uh, one in my district who, who won, uh, never been on an airplane. Uh, it's a real opportunity for folks to uh, expand their horizons and, uh, and to see all the, the beautiful works of art uh, in this town uh, and architecture. Um, and I would just say, first, congratulations to all the winners here. I know there are a lot of family members here as well who got to, to join those winners, but I just want to congratulate you, congratulate parents and friends and folks who support uh, the young artists, uh, because without you, uh, this would not be possible. Um, and you may not know it, and I had this number double-checked when I when I first saw it, but there's something like three million people pass through uh, the Capitol every year that will get to see your works. Uh, you will not be able to put a price tag on them, um, <clears throat> but there will be a lot of people seeing your artwork. And uh, uh, right now there are 407 works of art uh, hanging in the, uh, in the tunnel, I think that uh, was described to you earlier. I want to quickly tell you a little story with, a, with an Arkansas connection, and I just recently learned of this. Um, it's a story about Lavinia Ream. In 1861, uh, the year that the Civil War started, uh, Vinny Ream moved from Fort Smith, Arkansas, to Washington, D.C. And at the age of 17, she requested permission to sculpt a portrait bust of President Abraham Lincoln. Her request was approved, and she soon spent a half hour each day for five months working on a clay model of the president's likeness. As history would have it, she finished a clay bust the day Lincoln was shot. A few months after his death, Vinnie Ream was selected by Congress to sculpt a memorial statue of President Lincoln. She was both the first woman and the youngest individual to receive a federal art commission. And her statue still resides in the Capitol Rotunda, and I encourage all of y'all to go see it. And I would just say that, that the Capitol itself is not labeled an art gallery, but it is an art gallery. In fact, uh, the Visitor Center has some great art in it, uh, particularly sculptures. But if you will walk around uh, and take some time to look up, at some of the ceilings and the frescoes, you will find that art in the form of sculpture, painting, architecture is all around you. And I want to mention a few that I, that I want you to see while you're here. Because your art will be sharing space with John Trumbull's Declaration of Independence, which is in the rotunda. And many of you, I'm sure, have been to the rotunda. But you really need several visits while you're here to, to really take it all in. Take some time if you can p find a place. It's hard to find a quiet place in the rotunda. But take some time to, to just look at some of these uh, great works of art. Some are so vast that they take some time to digest. Uh, William H. Powell's Discovery of the Mississippi, which is in the rotunda. Battle of Lake Erie, which is in the Senate wing on the east stairway. Howard Chandler Christie's signing of the Constitution, which on, is in the House Wing, which I see a lot being in the House. Uh, Emanuel Lutz's painting of Westward Expansion, which is also in the House. 
So if you take some time to see some of those, uh, you will be inspiring others, and hopefully some of these will inspire you uh, as you proceed with your personal interest or, in, in many cases, your career. Uh, and I, I want to mention, because I am particularly proud of this, um, you're going to hear later from two folks from my district, Mitch and Elizabeth Breitweiser. I just met with them uh, a little while ago. And they are professional artists for uh, Marvel Comics. Who in here uh, reads or collects Marvel Comics? Anybody? Okay, there are quite, quite a few. Okay, well... Uh, Mitch grew up outside Little Rock, and uh, Elizabeth grew up in BB, Arkansas, which is not too far outside of Little Rock. They went to Harding University in Searcy, got their art degrees, and uh, it's interesting because uh, they work together as a dynamic duo, uh, and they both work, uh, they're married and both work for Marvel. And they have illustrated such iconic superheroes as Superman, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Spider-Man, Captain America, Fantastic Four, Iron Man, and the Hulk. And they have a presentation for you, for those of you lucky uh, enough to, uh, to get to stick around and see it. And they're going to walk you through uh, how they go about doing it. They literally work as a team. I was told by them earlier that for the most part, one of them draws and the other one does the coloring. Um, Elizabeth studied uh, coloring and colors uh, as part of her degree, and so uh, they sort of work as a team, and as any of you who read comics know, that they have to move along pretty quickly to get those done, and so they work as a team, and they're able to accomplish that. It's just a fascinating story with incredible art, and it'll be uh, something interesting for those who get to, uh, to stick around. But... Uh, I would just say congratulations, take a deep breath, enjoy your time here, and take some time to just look around here in the Capitol, visit the other art museums, but know that this is one of our best, one of the best art museums in America. Thank you again and congratulations. All right, um, I, I have two people I want to introduce for a, a short presentation, but I think they're two people who you're going to be very happy to meet. Uh, Monica Del Rio is with Southwest Airlines, and a lot of you are here today because of Southwest Airlines' generous sponsorship of the Congressional Art Competition. Uh, Monica is a specialist in community affairs and grassroots department at Southwest Airlines, which is one of the major airline uh, Fortune 500 company. Uh, she began her career at Southwest Airlines in 2008, and focuses her time and talent on Southwest, uh, Southwest employee engagement and grassroots advocacy programs. Uh, prior to her career at Southwest Airlines, Monica worked for the House members in both the state and federal level. Uh, she's a member of the Dallas Regional Chamber of Young Professionals, and she's a tried and true Texas native, um, which will mean more to the afternoon session since Texas goes in the afternoon. Um, uh, but she has a Bachelor of Arts in uh, Public Relations and Political Science. She and her husband live in Dallas, but she's most often found on the Southwest 737, traveling back and forth to her favorite cities. Please join me in welcoming Monica Del Rio. Thank you. Um, good morning, and welcome to Washington, D.C. I'm excited to be here on behalf of Southwest Airlines and to congratulate all of you on your incredible achievements. Your unique and powerful artwork will be admired by, admired by thousands of daily visitors in our nation's capital. Um, as mentioned, after college, I had the opportunity to work at the Capitol, and I was a congressional intern. So one of the main duties of a congressional intern is to give tours to constituents that are coming from the district and um, all over the country um, to give them tours of the Capitol. And we always started our tours the same way, and that was through the hallway where your artwork now hangs. And it was so interesting and exciting to watch our constituents slow down and ask, you know, where's the one from our district, and just discuss all the pieces of artwork. So you should be very proud in knowing that at any given moment during the day, there are people from all walks of life, all different parts of the country, admiring and discussing your artwork. 
Um, one of the many reasons I enjoy working for Southwest is our unique culture of supporting the communities. And this is our 11th year to support the Congressional Art Competition, showing our continued commitment through the arts and recognizing our youth as well. So this year, we were excited that we set a record high of, um, of supporting 333 of the eligible offices through donations of two round trip tickets each. And we are grateful to the 2012 co-chairs co for um, their outstanding talent as well in recognizing our nation's youth and their artistic ability and leadership. So we're so proud to be here with you today to celebrate your achievements, wish you many successes, and enjoy the rest of your trip. Great, our next uh, guest is Cecilia Marshall. Uh, she was born and raised in Northern Virginia, which is very rare because almost no one in Washington is actually from Washington. Um, she attended Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology and received the Bachelor of Fine Arts a degree in photography from Savannah College of Art and Design. Uh, after graduating with honors from SCAD, Marshall moved to New York City and worked as an art producer at the advertising agency for five years, most notably the uh, advertising agency BBDO, New York. Uh, Cecilia is now a director of regional recruitment. You heard that, right? Regional recruitment, that means scholarships. Um, for the uh, South Carolina Arts, uh, uh, Art and Design College the admission department, and she resides in Fairfax County. Please join me in welcoming someone who's handing out scholarships, Cecilia Marshall. All right, good morning. So uh, I'm Cecilia Marshall, and I'm delighted to be here this morning representing the Savannah College of Art and Design, and wanted to thank the Congressional Institute and our co-chairs for this year. Congratulations to each of you for your accomplishment in your district. The Savannah College of Art and Design is pleased to recognize your district first place award in the annual Congressional Arts Competition as an outstanding achievement. As a district first place winner in the 2012 Congressional Art Competition, you may be eligible to receive a SCAD Artistic Scholarship of at least $3,000 per year should you apply and be accepted uh, for enrollment to the college. You also can be eligible for a higher artistic scholarship or an academic scholarship. We're a private college, uh, we're accredited, and we're nonprofit. We confer bachelor's and master's degrees in more than 40 majors. SCAD is uniquely qualified to prepare talented students for professional careers. The university offers distinctive yet complementary locations in Savannah, Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia, Lacoste, France, Hong Kong, which I just got back from, and online. The education and career preparation of each SCAD student is nurtured and cultivated by our extraordinary faculty through individual attention in an inspiring university environment. And then I just wanted to thank you guys again for coming to the district. Congratulations, and hopefully see some of you in the fall. Have a good day. All right, here's a, a real treat, usually the best part of our program. Um, because you get to see other artists. Yeah, I, I kind of stand off because I have like a real hard time drawing stick figures. So I get, but you need people like me because we get to appreciate the good work that you do. And these two artists uh, that uh, uh, Congressman Griffin talked about, Mitch and Elizabeth Breitweiser, are, uh, I think it's a real treat. Uh, uh, Their hometown studios in downtown Little Rock. It's a husband and wife team. Uh, and they have breathed life into some of the popular cultures of most celebrated heroes and notorious villains. Uh, Mitch, as, as from uh, Harding University, fulfilled his lifelong love affair of arts and story when he began working for Marvel Comics in 2005. He's gone on to illustrate many of Marvel's famous heroes, but is most known for his work on several critically acclaimed Captain America books. Uh, Mitch and Elizabeth met in 2005, shortly after he began illustrating full-time, while she was also a Harding University senior art student with a love of painting and ceramics. Uh, with some gentle nudging from her illustrator husband, she traded her canvas and brushes for Photoshop and a Wacom tablet uh, in 2007, and she's quickly snatched up by Marvel as a color artist after producing a handful of samples. With a keen eye for color harmonies and an outsider's willingness to experiment, Elizabeth has revolutionized the importance of color as a narrative tool and has won acclaim from critics and peers alike. Uh, Mitch and Elizabeth are currently utilizing their unique knowledge of narrative and illustration to operate a full-service studio for clients like Marvel, Warner Brothers, AMC, 
HarperCollins, and others. Please join me in welcoming Mitch and Elizabeth Breitweiser. Hi guys, how are you doing today? Uh, what a fantastic honor it is to be here, and what a fantastic honor for you guys to be here as well. And I think all of you deserve a round of applause. I, uh, you, you guys are uh, some of our, our future's brightest artistic talents, and our entire culture rests on your shoulders, so no pressure, all right? Uh, special thanks to uh, Congressman Tim Griffin and his staff, uh, as well as the Congressional Institute and the very helpful Tim Lang, who helped facilitate uh, this all for us uh, to be here. Uh, let's see if we can. I got some slides coming up for you too here in a little bit, but uh, I want to talk to you a little bit. I'd much rather. I'm not a a, 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 a a person who's skilled in rhetoric. I'd say I'd much rather gather you all up in a big studio with a bunch of drafting tables and huddle around with some pencils and, and really get into the nitty gritty. But uh, what I can do today uh, is share with you some of my work and share with you my, my journey as an artist uh, from how I discovered uh, my love of comics and storytelling and my love of art and, oh, we're getting there, uh, and uh, where it's taken me and uh, the, the path that I had to go through to get where I am today. We're getting there slowly but surely. Uh, well, I've been a, an illustrator full time now for about seven years for Marvel Comics. And as uh, just to reiterate earlier, we've, I've worked on uh, Hulk, Spider-Man, Fantastic Four, most notably known for uh, my Captain America work. And as he said, I met, I met Elizabeth shortly after I began uh, my professional career. And Elizabeth, if you could stand up. She's here in the front row, or in the third row here. My lovely wife, Elizabeth, and very talented. Uh, and after I share with you my, my journey and my experiences, she's going to come up, uh, up here, and we're going to do a little bit of a Q&A session. So I hope you guys have some really great questions, and I, I look forward to having a little bit of a dialogue with you, because I know I'll be able to learn just as much from you guys as uh, hopefully you will from me, because uh, uh, you guys are certainly an inspirational as well. Uh, I turned Elizabeth on to comics. Uh, she was not interested, uh, too interested in it. She was a, a very talented painter, but uh, comics, we're sort of a, kind of a lowbrow art form in a, in a way. Uh, we take a lot of pride in being a lowbrow art form, but uh, we, we, we certainly needed very talented uh, color artists. We had a lot of talented illustrators, and there's some fantastic American illustrators that, uh, have, that have pioneered this industry in the past. Uh, but we were sorely in need of great color artists. And uh, I, I knew Elizabeth had a real talent, and so I, I kind of turned her on to it, and um, she was snatched up you know, really quickly and has, has really forged a, uh, a great path for herself in this industry and won a lot of critical acclaim. Well, we're, we're still waiting on the slides there. I want to show you some of her work, but uh, I'll go ahead and uh, mo move on here. Uh, I also wanted to show you a little bit, a picture of our studio when we get back up here, but uh, we've, we've been very fortunate to uh, be part of an interesting transition in, the, in, in illustration and in comics. Um, when I first started, it was in 2005, uh, I, I did not own a computer uh, at all. I, I was just, I drew on, on you know, pen and ink on illustration board and that was it. Um, I, I would uh, go down to uh, the FedEx at Kinko's and mail in my samples. There was all, a lot of late night runs to mail in uh, art, art samples and, and turn in pages to Marvel uh, when I began working there. And I've been f fortunate to, to be part of this almost a revolutionary transition from uh, this, this old style of in, into a, a completely digital illustration world almost. And uh, I just wanted to show you a picture of our studio when we get it back up and show you how we work digitally as well as traditionally. And we, we've been uh, fortunate to uh, be able to blend, 
I work, uh, Elizabeth works completely digitally in Photoshop and on a, a Wacom Cintiq tablet that uh, allows her to just do phenomenal things with color. It's really a limitless. And uh, I'm part of a group of, of, of well, we were young artists. We're, we're starting to, we're, we're more seasoned now, I guess. I'm uh, seven or eight years into it. Um, where we're working in computers and then also working by hand and blending the two uh, in a way that was not possible even seven years ago when I started out. And I know that's something that you guys are really going to experience uh, because you've, you've grown up with, with these computers and, uh, and no matter what you guys do from teaching, if you guys go into illustration or even if you go into fine arts, um, Th these tools are going to uh, be a part of your life. Um, and hopefully we'll, I'll, I'll show you that here in a little bit. Um, but I'll, I'll come back to that when, uh, when we get the slides back up. Uh, my theme today uh, is, is the artist's journey. And I just want to tell you just about my story, uh, about my, how I discovered my love for narrative and storytelling and combined that with my love of drawing as a child. Um, and I just hope that, that um, is this build as a workshop, of course, but unless I've got a pencil and paper and a bunch of you guys huddled around me, it's, it's hard for me to really treat it like a workshop. So I'm just going to tell you my story and, and hope that you can glean something from that. Uh, because that story is universal. Uh, my, my experience is unique, but it's also uh, a, a common experience. It's, it's, you're, go, you're gonna meet the same types of people and have the same types of up, ups and downs. Uh, but if you, I know you guys are like me. When you picked up, you first were able to grip a crayon and put that crayon to paper. Uh, it was probably an experience much like uh, flint and steel. Uh, Instead of you know Neolithic people, we were we were you know chubby infants putting crayon to paper for the first time and, and letting that magic happen, and that's a common experience amongst every child. Uh, but for some reason, everyone in this group, uh, you're like my my brethren here. Uh, it just it just ignited something, ignited a fire for you, just like it did for me, and you just never stopped, and that's led you to where you are today, and that's just absolutely fantastic. Um, for me, um, I'm gonna. I guess I'm gonna reveal to you that I'm not only an art nerd, but I'm an actual nerd. So, I mean, big, big surprise, right? The guy that draws comics is kind of a nerd. Um, so, uh, it, when I was you know, my generation, um, we, we were all into Star Wars and Spider-Man and Captain America, and all of my art peers and art friends. We all wanted to draw comic books. So for you guys, I imagine it's a very similar story where you're probably all into Harry Potter, which is just as fantastic as Star Wars. Uh, and, but you guys all want to work for Pixar. If, you, if you're anything like the younger students that I've met in the past, you, you're really into the, uh, to that. And it's, it's a, you're, you're probably hearing some of the similar things um, that it's, it's difficult. Uh, you're, you're getting the same responses that I got. And it is. It is, it's, it is a difficult path to walk, uh, the, the artist path. Well, I guess we're still waiting here. Um, I hope I get to show you guys some of my artwork later on. We're getting there. They're working it out. Um, but uh, so I'm assuming you, a lot of you guys are interested in, in illustration. And if you're interested, oh, yay, here we are. <laughs> Fantastic. Now I can kind of find my feet a little bit. Uh, this is a piece, this is the, the last piece Elizabeth and I did together it was uh, a promotional piece for a convention that we went to. Uh, and Elizabeth that did an absolutely wonderful job. So now you can see some of her talent here. And uh, I provide uh, the black and white illustrations and she is the, you know, the color theorist and the color expert and she is, is just absolutely wonderful at color harmony and she provided all the color work here. And and I can move on to my theme, which is the artist's journey. And, and this is what I wanted to showcase a little bit of Elizabeth's talent here, just because just I'm really super proud of her and I like to show her off a little bit. Um, this is a couple of uh, pieces that she's done really recently that I just thought were really super fantastic. Uh, on the left is just a, 
a beautiful sequence uh, that she colored. The, the drawings are, are excellent, I think, but um, the color really is what makes that sing because she could have gone way overboard and, and had a million colors, but she just kept, kept it gray and yellow and it just, to me, was extremely powerful. Um, and on the right, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit uh, uh, washed out on this screen, but uh, it's a, a wonderful color job she did for a recent, uh, this was a, for a, Cap Marvel did a Captain America book specifically uh, for our overseas uh, service members. And uh, this was shipped overseas uh, to Iraq and Afghanistan and, and probably Germany as well and it, a lot of foreign bases and deployed uh, service, service people. And uh, she actually got an email the other day uh, from a service member thanking her for working on this project and she was really proud of that. And so that was, and she did just an absolutely wonderful job coloring that, that cover. So I'm very proud of her. Yay. <laughs> Um, this is our studio. Uh, yeah, those are our mascots. Those are our little studio mascots. I think every studio needs a, a mascot. Um, but it's, it's really fantastic to be a freelance artist. Um, and you guys are in school now, so you, ha you have a responsibility from eight to five, just, uh, you know. But w when you get past your, you know, when you're done with your education, you finally venture out, uh, you're going to find a lot of, it's, there's a lot of freedom in being an artist. You can live anywhere you choose. You can work anywhere you choose. You can travel as long as your means allow. Um, and you can create magnificent things from nothing. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a career that is, is both, um, that is, it's just extremely limitless in what you can do. Uh, and you sort of invent your own life, and it's it's a great uh, freedom. And I think uh, it, what what better country to be a, an artist, uh, a free artist, in than a, a great free country? So, um, but this is uh, my setup on the left, and her setup on the right. And as you can see, her setup is just computers. She she works completely digitally. Uh, these the the two monitors in front of us there are the Wacom Cintiqs. Some of you guys, I'm sure, have used Wacom products. If you're going to be an illustrator. Uh, you're, you're going to have to be very familiar with these, or if you're going to do any kind of production art. Um, if Those of you who, who are going to be fine artists as well, these are f wonderful tools um, to blend into your fine artwork. Um, and if you're going to be a teacher, they're excellent tools. Um, but we use these tools every single day, and if you guys have any questions about them, we're, we're certainly happy to answer them later on. Um, and then I still, I, I draw, uh, she colors completely digitally, I work, I do all my layouts and my uh, underdrawings and underpaintings digitally, and then I take them over to my drafting table on the left and I finish them all by hand so that um, even though the computer gives me this ability to rearrange it on the fly and do masking and cropping and resizing, it's really, uh, as a production artist, which is a basically a time-based job, uh, we have, not only if we go faster do we make more money, but if we don't get it done on time, we, the books are laid and you know, it causes a big catastrophe all, you know, all the way down the line. So be, working digitally was a, a necessity for us, um, but it also has uh, been a wonderful experience and it's improved, I know it's improved my artwork, being able to, to, to um, rearrange and change on the fly. Uh, uh, but when I'm uh, done with laying out a piece, I will just print it out in very, like a, I'll print it out in a very light gray or light blue and finish it all by hand so that when it actually uh, gets into print, it still has that hand-drawn, hand-done uh, hand look to it. Um, and anyway, these are our two mascots on the bottom, Chumley and Hamburger. And like I said, every, every great studio needs a good little mascot. But they're, they're a little bit, they're an inspiration too, so. Uh, this is actually a piece that I did. Uh, this is a digital, digitally painted piece, uh, which I'm using as my, uh, that's supposed to say my journey on it, but our, our justification got a little bit off. Uh, but this is a digitally painted piece for a Captain America cover, and um, this is, you know, pretty, pretty standard uh, kind of comic book cover, uh, but uh, one of my favorite images that, I, that I've done, and uh, it, I've, it has a, a, a very special meaning to me, and it kind of deals, uh, 
if you're going to be an illustrator, uh, if you're going to be a cover artist or a book cover artist, um, just doing a flashy image of Captain America or Spider-Man just doesn't work. Um, it, it, it falls flat. You can't just have a, a cover or an image that has no inspiration and no expression and no meaning behind it. Um, so with every cover I try to tackle and every illustration I try to tackle, um, I, want to, I want there to be a deeper context to it all. So in this particular uh, story inside, you know, inside the cover here, uh, dealt with uh, one costume Captain America dies and, and another costume Captain America takes over his place uh, by the end of the story. So I, I turned this whole theme into a birth, a death, and a resurrection image. Uh, so if you're going to be an illustrator, it's not just about providing a flashy image uh, that is attention-grabbing and colorful and has no context and no deeper meaning. Uh, any type of art you do should have a uh, should ha have some sort of deeper context to it so that not only does it jump out off the shelf and make a, a customer want to pick it up and flip through the book but uh, they they look at it a, a day or two later and, and scratch their heads and say you know wow there's really something a little bit more to this and that's why I keep coming back to it um, so that's what gives that the uh, the illustration and uh, a shelf life and a soul and uh, and everything else um, but anyway, I was just using this slide to, to introduce you to my journey as an artist. Um, my journey really began in second grade. And I, I hope everybody had as a good a time in second grade as I did, because I had a fantastic time. Uh, we had every day, uh, or nearly every day as I remember it, uh, like it, that was a long time ago. My, my memory may be a little bit colored. Um, but uh, every day we had writing and drawing time. It was either one or the other, a combination of the both, but we had creative time every single day. And uh, it, I thought from there on out, school was going to be awesome. This thing called school that you know, other kids might dread, I thought it was just gonna be absolutely fantastic. We are in for the best time ever because this is what we got to do every single day. And then, you know, for an hour or two, you, know, you learn about history and you know, we do writing and, or, you know, letters and all that stuff. And that was fine, too. I, I, was learning other subjects is, is extremely important to your artwork. And as you get older, I, I, total, I, I really encourage artists to, in, in college, if, if you're going to be an art major, get a philosophy minor or get a, a literature minor or something. Take those other courses and learn those other Find out what else inspires you, because that's what inspires your work. But anyway, uh, I thought you know, school was just going to be fantastic. Uh, I was already, at this point, I was a voracious reader as a kid, and also a voracious drawer, is that a word? Uh, but, uh, but, but, and I would do a lot of creative writing. And so, what I would do in this, in this time would be to, of course, I'm, I'm dating myself a little bit, but I would rewrite, during this creative time, I would rewrite and redraw episodes of the Smurfs and the Care Bears. You guys remember them? <laughs> this was like 1982 or so. Uh, but anyway, I was really into the Smurfs and Care Bears in second grade, so don't judge me. Um, and, <laughs> But any time I rewrote and redrew those episodes, they were probably all like Care Bears with machine gun belts and whatever else. So that's just where my imagination went. Um, so it wasn't, it's not too sad. Uh, but that, that's what we did. She, it, and we had a wonderful teacher um, who gave me a lot of positive reinforcement. And at some point, as I'm sure it has for you guys, you began to form an, an artist's identity. So the, you had a teacher that, that picked you out and, and said there's something special here. Uh, but almost more importantly, uh, you had uh, your peers in your class come up to you and say, hey, draw me this. You're, you're good at this. You know, I recognize your gift here. Um, so I, I'm, I'm sure you guys have had similar experiences to that or else you wouldn't be here and have believed in yourself up to this point. Um, to get your, to 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 be here, um, and so that's kind of where I developed this identity as an artist. 
Um, and I, a couple of instances that I remember specifically, she passed out, uh, our teacher passed out a, a blank page that had a thumbprint in the middle. And she just said, go, you, you, you just create with this. And of course, every, most kids would just take the thumbprint and then they draw a hand around it because that's where your mind goes. Uh, if you kids did a few other things, made it into trees or clouds, and then I, I, I had turned it into a helicopter, and she just was like, I don't know where you came up with that, but that was, that was really interesting. But, um, and also, uh, I was at this time already, I, had, I, didn't, I didn't quite know what a comic book was. I was a little too probably young in second grade to know what a comic book was, but I was, uh, there were these little toys out at the time called Micro Machines. I don't know if you guys remember the commercials where the guy would talk really, really fast, and he would, they would sell these little tiny plastic cheap cars. Uh, you could buy them at Walmart for like you know, five or six dollars or whatever. And I just had this idea that these little cars needed little characters in them. So I had invented a whole storyline and a whole line of, of characters called the Micro Men, and they all had names like Spunky and Funky and Plunky and you know, stupid stuff like that. But I was already writing and drawing my own uh, things and it, being inspired by what I was consuming media-wise and what I was seeing around me. Um, and then th three or four years later, I knew I was onto something when they actually re released a product called Micro Men. But I, think it, I don't think it sold very well. But, but I knew I was onto something, so. Um, but anyway, that's it. I remember specifically when we, uh, they had those, the parent-teacher conferences that, of course, you parents have all been through and then the, 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 ch the you guys have all dreaded. Uh, you know, are, you know, celebrated. Uh, and p mom and dad came home from parent-teacher conference uh, from my second grade teacher, and she, they, she had told them that uh, Mitch is either going to be a writer or an artist. And I remember my m mother cringing a little bit. I think she was, she was really concerned, you know. This is, this is a, uh, you know, th that's, a, that's, a, that's a tough path to walk. He could be a, you know, why don't you... Let's steer him towards accounting or maybe uh, uh, an English degree or be a lawyer or uh, a doctor uh, or such, you know, like the song, old song goes. Um, but she, she had told them I was either an artist or writer. Uh, and it wasn't three years late. It was probably three years later when my father brought home this new thing that I had, had never had heard of but had never seen before, uh, and that was the comic book. Um, and he, uh, I'll, sh I'll actually show you. I, ha I found it online before I, I was putting these slides together last night, and I had to look this up. This is the first comic book my dad ever brought me, and it, it was an absolutely transformational experience for me uh, because I was able to, I, instantly I saw there was a connection for me between narrative and reading and writing and drawing, and there's somebody that does this for a living. There's somebody that 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 takes a story and gives it life. And I knew instantly that that's what I wanted to do. Um, and I, I hope you guys are lucky enough to have, have had moments like this, um, whether it's for teaching art or being a, a fine artist or an animator or an illustrator or cartoonist, whatever it is. Um, I, I'll never forget it. It was a Christmas stocking present, right? So I, I pulled it out and then I think at the same year, Dad brought home a, a pinball machine, and which is, a, I mean, phenomenal. It was like a completely mind-blowing experience to have a pinball machine for Christmas. Uh, this is before video games, right? So, <laughs> so a pinball machine completely blew my mind. Um, but the comic book, that two-dollar comic book, meant, really meant more to me than the, the entire pinball machine, which constantly broke down anyway. Um, but this was, and, and this was actually drawn by uh, a gentleman named Rick Leonardi, who now, s I, six months ago, I was at a comic book convention doing a signing, and he is still a working illustrator, and he was sitting just two rows down from me and, and had a, a great pleasure meeting him. And, and I mean, just what a phenomenal experience, because I've been able to, my peers now are the, the guys that I really looked up to when I was a kid. Um, and this was drawn by Rick Leonardi and inked by, uh, uh, Al Williamson, and uh, some of you uh, older guys might be familiar with Al, Al Williamson. I would be remiss if I didn't share you, tell you about Al Williamson. He passed, I, I think it was 2011. Um, 
but Al was an absolutely phenomenal talent, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't show you some of his work, because historically, he is one of our, he is an American treasure, absolutely. I mean, that is just, he is a phenomenal illustrator, and I think every, every artist should know who he is, um, and he, we certainly do miss his talent. Um, so if there's any historians here, please put him in the art history books. He's, he's, uh, uh, he is sorely missed. Um, but anyway, after second grade, I was, it was a bit crushing. Um, creative time was, at least in my school district, I know now it's probably a, a lot different, and I hope it's different for you guys. From then on, it went from, uh, it, it really went from reward to repudiation. Drawing, drawing in class became something you, I got in trouble for. Uh, it became a, a secret thing you had to do in the margins of your test papers and then erase before you turned them all in. Um, it, it was, you know, on the backs of the notebooks and then you'd have to flip them and hide your little drawings. Uh, it, 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 it was an absolute, for me, it was an absolutely soul-crushing experience. Uh, and I know you guys have probably had experiences like that as well. Um, but it was sort of like a, a wilderness years for me. Uh, I was very fortunate to have, though, some really caring parents and encouraging uh, parents and grandparents, um, as, as um, we got a room full of encouraging parents here, which is fantastic. I think you guys deserve a round of applause because if, if the parents, come on, for the parents, because <laughs> if it, um, I, I certainly have met um, other artists who have, had, who have struggled um, and haven't had parents that were there for them. Um, so just the fact that you guys are here is really phenomenal, and all of you kids will really appreciate it later on. If you don't already, I'm sure I'm sure you do. Um, but when Dad brought home that comic book, everything changed for me. Uh, and during these wilderness years, I uh, my parents kept me encouraged. Uh, they they enrolled me in a couple of uh, painting classes, um, and they they of course were a little bit wary of my love of comic books. I'm sure they just thought it was a passing interest, but, but for me, it was uh, absolutely captivating. Uh, I had a, a grandmother who had a sister who was a painter, and so she, she, I think, was the one who really recognized there was something here and that I wasn't gonna hang it up. Um, and, and she was uh, the one that facilitated me to explore other areas of art, uh, which is super important. Um, I, I meet a lot of young, I, I review a lot of portfolios uh, as an illustrator. Uh, a lot of young artists come up and want to get reviewed, and I can see immediately when the, that young artist has only looked at two or three guys, and is just copying what he sees, and which is a natural thing. I copied. Um, I, I took those influences and, tr and, and, and copied them and tried to learn from them. Uh, but, but Grandmother was the one that, that took me and, and said, you need to try this oil painting thing and try, try, a, try a still life and try a landscape and um, exploring is, and, and learning uh, other methods and other tools uh, is, is such an important thing uh, to do. Um, and if it wasn't, uh, I, 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 I get a lot of, uh, uh, I, I guess, uh, accolades for sort of having a painterly style, a, painter, a painterly brush and ink style. Um, even in my black and white interior work, which I, I always do with a brush and not a pen. And that comes from that. That comes from learning to paint. That comes from being an oil painter and experimenting uh, in high school before I went on to college uh, and, and expanding my horizons and on my own time, um, not waiting for someone else to, to, uh, to teach you, but getting a book and, and learning for yourself and going to the library and teaching yourself watercolor and teaching yourself oil paint. Uh, in fact, um, when I got to college, I was actually really shocked um, that they're in freshman oil painting class that I, I was only one of like two or three students in the entire freshman class that had ever touched and smelled, or touched oil paint and smelled linseed oil and had that experience. Um, to me, that was just something that like if, if, if I had, there was no question whether I wouldn't do, uh, do that or not in high school. Uh, no one had to, you know, to tell me. It was just something that, you know, that needed to be done. Um, but anyway, uh, I wanted to, uh, to touch on a little bit about my high school experience um, because, uh, just really quickly, I, I finally, 
at least in, in our school district, um, we, we finally had art classes again in high school as an elective, and I was super excited. I mean, I was really pumped to get back into to art classes um, and have a real art teacher. Uh, unfortunately, that one year, uh, with the, the 10th grade year, was um, the teacher, she was on her retirement year. And I think she was ready to check out and go and have pina coladas on the beach. And I don't blame her at all. You know, I, I do not blame her at all. Uh, and she had a student teacher that year who, um, who came in and basically taught the class. And I, I was really pumped to learn more about art. And I, I think she, she was really pumped to teach us about doll making. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, it was a bit of an incongruency there as to what I wanted to learn and what she wanted to teach. And I, I assumed she was going to be the teacher for the rest of my high school career. Uh, and I was actually been really discouraged, and was actually, and I was probably on the order of dropping out and 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 um, considering other paths. Uh, fortunately, the school district um, hired a, another teacher who uh, was really enthusiastic and called me up on summer break and uh, said uh, that the, the staff here at the school uh, mentioned that I was really interested in, in the program and, and he you know, invited me over and encouraged me to get back into it and, and came up with, he invented classes for me and uh, got with the board and it, it really arranged for me to have a wonderful high school experience in art. So those of you that are going to be teachers Keep that in mind. Uh, I'm sure some of you will go through that, and some of you, some of you parents are probably art teachers, art teachers in general. But that kind of stuff really makes a difference. Uh, my wife, who actually spent some, she spent two years as a teacher right after we got married, uh, before she became a color artist, and uh, I know she inspired uh, a lot of kids uh, with her energy and her enthusiasm. And so, uh, I. I Please be enthusiastic to your to your students. It really makes a difference. Um, but anyway, uh, onward to uh, just a quick touch on on our college experience. Um, again, with I want to re reiterate the experimentation. Learn, take the philosophy class. Uh, it's important to understand why you're doing a piece as it is just to learn how to do the piece. Uh, putting the context behind every brush stroke is super important. Um, learn other things. Uh, if, you, if you have some figures, from, if you're interest, interested in figure work, uh, not only learn human anatomy, but I think philosophy and literature and science is super important as well. I mean, it, it, art is one of those those uh, professions that absorbs everything else around it, uh, because that's that's what it does. You you are the sponge. Um, your your brain soaks it all up, and your hand communicates it and interprets it and uh, puts it, puts your influences back out into the world for others to see uh, and for others to change the perspective uh, 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 of other people. Um, but. In college, you're also going to meet, uh, and hopefully, you'll meet these people throughout your life. You're going to meet uh, what I call, well, you're going to meet your mentors, uh, and you're going to meet those that are going to hold you back and give you some warnings uh, that we call our, the threshold guardians, I guess. Uh, but you're going to meet these people uh, and learn from these mentors and learn from the ones that are holding you back, because those that are giving you the warnings, uh, usually are doing it out of a, a sense of caution or a sense of love or caring for you. I, I know I had, I had two professors in college that really meant a lot to me. One of them, Dr. Keller, who was the head of the art program at, at Harding, he would warn me that, uh, well, you know, he, he, he had found out I was really interested in, in comics um, and I was a very enthusiastic art student. But he uh, took me aside and had, had told me, I've had a lot of you. I've had, every year there's two or three of you, got, of you. Uh, the one that wants to do this. And uh, for my entire 20-year you know, history as a professor, I've had exactly zero actually go on to do this as a for a living. Um, I was just, I just, I wasn't actually extraordinarily talented. 
I was just actually extraordinarily stubborn, I think. More than anything else, I really just wanted to prove those people wrong. I wanted to prove it to myself. Um, and I know they were doing it out of a, 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 a love for me and uh, wanting to shepherd my talent into a, a place that would where I could be successful. But I really just, I let the passion take over and the stubbornness. Um, and I had another uh, professor, Mr. Pitt, who was um, my, my uh, drawing professor. And um, he was this hands-off, uh, Zen-like mentor professor. I hope you all meet someone like Mr. Pitt. He is a, he was the ceramics teacher and uh, uh, just, a, just a normal old white guy from Arkansas, but had adopted this uh, Native American-like lifestyle and had uh, <laughs> and ad adopted, he had been uh, given a Native American name, Coyote Clay. And uh, he, he just completely lived a, a, a zen-like uh, artistic lifestyle, and he had this sort of hands-off encouragement uh, experience uh, with me, and he, he was a very, every, no one liked Mr. Pitt. Well, not no, not, not, people liked Mr. Pitt, but he was a hard professor, and I hope you have hard teachers. Uh, I hope you have those that push you. Um, you're not always gonna like them, uh, but you're gonna respect them. Um, and he had this sort of hands-off and cold, uh, attitude towards it, but at the but I knew he, I always worked hard for him, and at the end uh, of my senior year, he took me aside and just said, and told me, uh, had some very special words right before I left, and that's, it was just a few sentences, and that's all he had to say, uh, just a few sentences to, just to tell me that he appreciated how hard I worked, and that uh, I was a really special student to him uh, for working so hard, and uh, Coming from a guy like that, it was just an absolutely, it, it really propelled me out of college with a, a, a real enthusiasm. Uh, but that's, that's really where the story starts, uh, and that's where your story is going to start as well. Once you get out of school and you get out of that environment, um, if, if you're anything like me, that's when the, the, uh, the reality check of the, the professor that, uh, that was the threshold guardian uh, that's where the rea that his reality sets in. I, I get out and I was super enthusiastic. I was going to be an artist. I had put together my portfolio. I had done. I had checked off all the marks. I was going to go to conventions and show my work. I, I had made plans to move to New York, and I was just a small town Arkansas kid. Just I wasn't a redneck kid, but I, I was probably pretty close. Just a small town boy. I had never been actually north of Washington D.C. of all places, and so here I was uh, making big plans to move to New York, and I and I, I found out very quickly that New York is very expensive, <laughs> as, as he knows. Um, so I, I made it as far as, as the Hudson River and stopped in New Jersey, and that, that was all I could afford. <laughs> so, and that was more than I expected. Um, but, I, but I did that, and I, uh, because that's where the, the publishers were, uh, and that's where I knew I had to be to meet the right people. Um, and this is back, you guys probably consider this the dark ages. Uh, this is, I, did, I, I moved to New York without a cell phone and without a computer. So I was doing it the old fashioned way. Uh, today, it's, artists are really fortunate because you can network and make contacts and build networks digitally, uh, which was not, not, we were you know, still five or six, seven years away from Facebook at the time and Tumblr and all these great things that are out there right now for you guys to use. And I hope you do use them because they're, they're phenomenal tools. Um, but uh, reality sets in there, and I, uh, I, I spent a lot, I had to spend a lot more time uh, serving coffee and lattes uh, than I wanted to. <laughs> there was about six, uh, uh, took me about six years of knocking on doors, uh, collecting business cards. I, I collected a very impressive collection of rejection letters. I mean, it was a stack like this high. I mean, it, this was a, it, it's just the process I had to go through and I thought for sure I was good enough to make it right out of college. And boy, I was completely wrong. I had to work a lot harder once I got out of school, um, but I am so much the better for it. Um, so I, I can't encourage you enough. If, if when you get out of school and things aren't clicking right away for you, just, just stick it through, push it through, uh, build your network, um, build your collection of rejection letters, and keep them forever, and show your children and your grandchildren. 
because it's a it's a it's like a trophy in a lot of ways, just to say you know I toughed it out and and I made it through. Uh, but also, in that six years, I, there was one other thing I did that really helped me. Uh, I was traveling to conventions and showing work around, and I always learned when I traveled. And I always learned when I got a portfolio review from a professional or from an edit, uh, someone in editorial, uh, or even from a writer uh, who may not even have any artistic talent. They, they, because they were professionals, they knew what they were talking about. So show your work. Show your work to people. and. Uh, learn from them. And if, if someone tells you that your anatomy is off and you don't think it is, uh, but you can ignore that. But if five people tell you your hands are wrong, then there, there's probably something wrong with the hands you're drawing or, or there's something wrong with your composition. There's, there's something not in harmony with your work if, if, if people keep pointing it out and work on those things and have, have a thick skin about it and uh, overcome and, uh, and learn from it. Uh, but for me, six years in your early 20s does seem like a very long time. Uh, and I had hit this 26, I was about 26, and I was really getting frustrated. And uh, I thought maybe the art career wasn't going to work out. And so I left New York. Um, and I sort of spent a year uh, back in the South again and thought I'd be, I thought I'd be a, uh, in a band. And that was a terrible decision. <laughs> I was a much better uh, artist than I was a, a guitar player. Uh, but. But something, uh, something sort of miraculous happened for me, uh, and and that was I got rear-ended in a car. I was I was a, my car got totaled completely, uh, and so I was this broke guy wanting to be an artist or a musician. I couldn't make up my mind at the time. My car got rear-ended, or I got rear-ended. My car got totaled, um, and so I I decided I, I I got a check for a lot more than the car was worth. So I had this like eight thousand dollar check, and I was. Uh, I had no other money in the bank. And so I, I was forced to either, I was considering my options, and I had two options. It was to buy a, a used car and just plot along back in, in Nashville where I was playing music, or I could actually go back to New York and see how far this $8,000 goes, um, which it turns out isn't very far at all. So there you go, in New York. Uh, but I bought a, I ended up buying a one-way ticket and packing a suitcase. and. Um, I thought I could maybe make it six months um, it, if I could make ends meet. And so I gave myself six months. And I said, if, I'm, if I don't make it in six months, it's really kind of over for me, which is a ridiculous thing to think at the age of 25 or 26, because <laughs> it's not over. Life is, there's a lot more life to live. Um, but I was going to give myself six months, and I was just going to just work my tail off. And, and I did. Uh, I, I lived in a little shoebox on 100th and Broadway. And every Friday, uh, again, relying on that peer network I built uh, in my convention experience, I had built a, a great network of peers. And it's so important to have peers uh, that uh, when, you're, when you're trying to get somewhere in the arts, have peers that are also trying to get to the same place, because they're going to inspire you, and you're going to learn from them. And you're going to lean on each other uh, and learn from each other. So one of my peers had become a professional at Marvel and was turning his work in. He lived in Chelsea and would go into the office every Friday and turn his work in. And he said, well, I can get you into the office every, you know, when I turn my work in. I won't tell anybody, because you're not supposed to do that, right? Um, so, so he would kind of get me in the mail room. And uh, what I would do is all week I would spend in my little shoebox of, of an apartment, literally. It was a converted hotel room. So I would spend all week there working on samples, building new samples, three or four pages a week. Um, and then about every Friday, I'd meet Sean down at Marvel, and he would let me in through the mail room and take me up, and he would say, okay, don't, don't, don't say I let you in. <laughs> and then I would go from editorial office to editorial office with photocopies. Um, and and I would, it, if the editors were busy, I would just drop the photocopies off uh, and just lay them on the desk or slide them under the door, and I'd have my name on it and my phone number and address. and. Uh, there we go. And then occasionally I'd meet an editor that had, you know, five minutes to spare, and he'd look it over. Um, and I, I don't—I guess I just was totally afraid I was going to fail, so I just lit a complete fire uh, under my tail and, uh, and and did this every Friday for for months. And 
eventually I got to know the people and I got better. They started handing me sample scripts to draw from and, and they were recognizing that every week the work got a little bit better and I was working a little bit harder. And uh, they would start to take a little bit more time with me and they, you know, certain editors would say, oh, there might be something here. I'm gonna give you a script from my office, do these three or four pages. So I would do that and uh, it, it, literally about at my six month limit mark, um, the money had long run out. <laughs> like I said, New York is expensive. Um, but I, I literally at the end of the six month mark, I, I got the phone call and it was, there's this book and we want you to try out for it. Uh, it's not, you know, nothing too major. Um, but anyway, I tried out and got it and the rest is history. Literally three months later, Marvel had signed me to a two year exclusive contract with them. And from that small project came a, a bigger Captain America project after that. And then I sort of made a, a mark with the Captain America project and have been working on many Captain America projects since then, uh, as well as you know the, the list I, we went through earlier. Um, and uh, left New York uh, about a year later and met Elizabeth and the rest is really history. And here we are you know, today uh, talking to you guys. So. That, that is essentially my journey as an artist, and I hope you guys can learn a little bit from that. Um, th there is a, a couple little things I wanted to touch on, and then I'm gonna show you some artwork, and then we're gonna open it up to questions. Um, I call this the artist journey, because I've, I've been reading a lot of Joseph Campbell work lately, and a lot of you may be familiar with this, or a lot of your parents may be familiar with Joseph Campbell. He was a mid-century, uh, 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 professor and writer and, uh, a, uh, I guess a, a, uh, he was a, a, a he studied mythology and uh, uh, just he went across the world studying different mythologies from all over the world and had come up with this theory called the monomyth that that uh, that uh, basically stories from or the myths from Japan are basically the same as the myths from South America and Africa and Norse and Greek that all of these, in, in the Middle East, that all of these myths have, have a certain thing in them that's similar, that touches the human spirit, and he called it the monomyth. And I discovered him through my love of Star Wars, and basically Star Wars wouldn't exist without Joseph Campbell, because, I mean, Lucas has basically admitted it was a wholesale lift. Uh, so, so as a narrator and as a storyteller, his work has really been an inspiration to me. Um, there's something I realized upon a further revisit and reading more of his books recently, that when I look back over my career, my path as an artist, the artist's journey, is essentially the hero's journey over and over and over again. And you guys are gonna experience the same things. You're going to be in your ordinary world and then have the call to adventure, which is your call to be an artist. And then uh, you're gonna meet your mentor and cross the threshold. Uh, so if, if you look at this path, I found that not, not only does this work for me as a storyteller, and it inspires me and gives me some context uh, into how I present narrative, but it also is the story. It is, it, it, it is the story that I'll always repeats, because uh, my wife and I are now in a new place where uh, we're both freelancers, uh, and we're not under contract with Marvel anymore, and we're running our own illustration studio. So we're almost back at the beginning of the, of the hero's journey again, starting completely over. Uh, not only working for Marvel, taking on new clients and doing new things. This is cycle is going to always repeat for you, and there's a lot to learn from it. Uh, but it's just something that I wanted to, it's, I saw, it was sort of the inspiration for the talk really today. And lastly, I just wanted to show you some of our, our work. This is basically what we do every day. Um, the cover paintings are are fewer and far in between. This is what pays our bills, and this is what gets the stories out and the stories done, the interior of the comic book pages. Um, on the left is a very traditional, typical comic book page. Um, I just want to take, take you through what I do every day, which in panel one is to take the reader by the hand and lead the reader through the page, uh, it, through the narrative in a visual way. And as a comic book artist, you should be able to know, understand exactly what's happening in the story uh, without any text or, of course, comic books have word balloons to get us through, uh, but 
with, without any text, you should be able to follow along and understand exactly what's happening. So on the left is a very traditional setup for a page that I do. Uh, I, I, I invite the reader in and give them a setting and give them some context and give them, uh, show them where they're at. So they're, I'm leading them in between this row of buildings into this uh, one building with the lights on that Elizabeth perfectly did here with the, with the lights on so your eye goes directly into it and you know exactly where you're at. And then in the middle, you have the meat of the story where the narrative happens and you do have a setup. Um, and then at the end, of course, you, uh, I either call it, I call it the period, the question mark, or the exclamation point. So at the last page, you either want to end the sentence or you want to, uh, in this particular case, it's a question mark. So there's a thud, thud, thud at the door. So it makes you want to turn the page to see who's at the door. So it's about taking the reader, as a comic book artist, it's about taking the reader by the hand and leading them through and presenting them with this question mark or exclamation point at the end and uh, inviting them to turn the page to see what happens next. Uh, and on the right is another page that, that my wife and I have, have done uh, for a recent book. Uh, it's, it's a very similar concept, but uh, in a more dramatic way where I used a, a very, um, there's a, uh, this is Captain Nemo and his submarine crashing down into a sea monster, which is some of the cool stuff you get to draw, right? As a comic book artist, we get to draw some wild stuff. Um, which is one of the reasons that attracted me to, to this as a career. Um, so I use this long panel tilted on its axis to give this sense of it plunging and crashing and uh, at the bottom. Uh, he's crashing into this uh, big sea god-like creature and I use the, the, uh, the, I like to use gate imagery. So I, I like to frame things with, um, uh, w with what I call gates. So on the right and the left, there's these big boulders he's passing through, and he's, plus he's passing through the spiral tentacle. So it creates this sort of uh, trippy, spirally uh, uh, sense of depth uh, that gives you th this sort of spirally crashing, well, hopefully to give you the experience of a crashing submarine, which is, you know, uh, probably isn't actually how a submarine crashes, but in this, in this case, you know, we'll exaggerate for the, for the, for the, uh, for the narrative here. Uh, again, these are all uh, brilliantly colored by Elizabeth uh, here. Uh, uh, two more that I wanted to talk about. Uh, again, on the left, I just wanted to mention that Elizabeth did an absolutely fantastic job with this. Again, reading the, taking the, the reader by the hand. Um, the submarine is pulled up out of the water uh, that we saw on the last page and into this you know, big floating ship. Well, cool, like I said, cool, weird, weird and cool stuff happens in Marvel comics. So we have big floating ships. Uh, and she, she colored the interior of this bright orange. Uh, and in order to give us context, and so we don't lose our place in the narrative on the second panel, she uh, colored the, uh, the number on the sign orange above it. Because if the whole thing was orange, it, you would totally, it would be really washed out. So she was very clever in, in making use of that uh, orange number eight above, and sign above their heads to remind you that uh, you're, you're in that place, you're in that orange setting. Uh, so I thought that was very brilliantly done. Uh, and on the right is a, uh, just another, I thought something that really was a little bit different from the regular narrative that we do that really works. Uh, behind the three very vivid panels is a, a World War II flashback. And you guys know, War Captain, of course you've seen the movie probably. So Captain America, the World War II character. And so in the front, uh, th this is modern day, the three very vivid panels. And in the back are these washed out flashbacks. And I, th I think this, was very effective in the narrative um, to give you the sense that uh, uh, between the modern and the, uh, the 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 vintage style flashback, and I, I felt it uh, again brilliantly colored, I think, by Elizabeth, um, but very successful page. And really, that's that's the end of my talk. I want to open it up Q and A, and I want to invite Elizabeth on stage. Do we have time for some questions and answers? A few. Uh, so, yay, there she is. Do, do we have some questions? Yes, yes, sir. Ah. He gets that all I get, the time. I, yeah, I he don't had know. a bow, we actually were gonna put a bow tie on him and he, well. had, he has it in his pocket. Whoa, we should have put it on. I should have done that. No. We're just happy to hear you know who Doctor Who is. We love that show. Yeah. <laughs> I was just born that way, so. 
He's older than Dr. If, if anybody, I'll be a stand-in if it pays well. <laughs> I mean, anybody else? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, um, I well, like I said but, uh, earlier, uh, when I first started, I had to ship them from FedEx into Marvel. So I would make these midnight runs in order to get them to Marvel to get them to print on time. Now it's absolutely fantastic because I just have a scanner right next to my computer and I just pop it in there and like five minutes later I've got it cleaned up just the way I want it. I can do my own corrections and I can clean up my mistakes. Uh, and then since she works literally like you know, 30, 20, 30 feet away from me, I could just zip it on over to her computer and then you know, she, she's working on it on the finished file minutes later and it really is fantastic. So when we work with other artists, um, the artist will send it to Marvel and then Marvel will reformat it and then send it to me. So, but we work together so I get it directly from him. But I get everything digitally. I don't, I could print it out and paint it traditionally but I don't get the actual artwork to paint on. And for what I do, I can experiment and move faster with Photoshop and the, with that technology, you can recreate a painted look and that's kind of what I'm known for a little bit. It's, I don't use a, you can't really tell it's digital and I think that's one reason I've been successful because I come from a fine art background and, and I can actually experiment with Photoshop and Command Z and I can try out a million different color schemes instead of being stuck with that one thing and then ruining it and have to rip it up or, so that's one brilliant thing in this day and age. There in the, the black shirt. Well, well uh, we work with professional writers, so... It's an assembly line process. Yeah, it's a, yeah, a bit of an assembly line process. Oh. Uh, but we work with professional writers, and we'll get a fully finished script usually from them. Um, so it, it basically looks very similar to a movie script or a TV show script, but it's broken down into pages and panels instead, you know, instead of by scene or whatever, like they do in, in TV. Um, so really, everything is fleshed out. Yeah, you, you wanted to follow up on that? Uh, I do. I, I right now am sort of developing some of my own properties. I'm working with a writing partner um, on a little project we, we're calling Bullet Ballet, which is a, a fictional World War II story that we're very excited about working on. And then I've, I, I've got a couple of, I've got a sort of a Southern Gothic costumed hero uh, called the Red Rooster that I, I doodle with a, a little bit that I want to introduce at some point. Stay um, tuned. It's going to be yeah, awesome. Yeah, so it's just stay tuned right on, on that. But, uh, but that's always been one of my goals personally was uh, I really wanted to work, I wanted to work in comics, not because I just loved to draw comic book characters. I really love, I really love the mechanics of storytelling and I love narrative. And I wanted to learn from, as a professional artist, how to make, how to make it work as a professional and build a fan base and, and build a, you know, a, meet some peers and really know what I'm doing and then go out on my own uh, as an adult and, and, and do my own thing and leave, hopefully leave a, some kind of mark uh, on, on the comic book world or on, on this visual sequential narrative world we live in over here. <laughs> you and, the, and then, then here. Sorry, I'll let him know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I had just four years of college, and I just got a, a regular art degree with an emphasis in painting. Uh, where I went, there really, there really aren't many schools that um, that teach specifically sequential narrative. There are a few schools that have classes. I know, like SCAD, I think has a class in New York, um, uh, has class, and then uh, I. Klaus Jansen, a friend, a, uh, a friend of mine, teaches uh, in New York, um, so I know he does a few classes. Um, and then there's the Kubert School that just teaches comics, but they're the only one. But there's a lot of schools where you can learn illustration, of course, and that, that is all relevant. Um, I think it's important to know, though, that for what we do, you don't have to have a college degree. It's talent. The, the college degree and the art lessons are invaluable. and. I mean, that's how I know color theory. Yeah. I think that's why I'm a successful color artist because there's a lot of color artists working for Marvel who know nothing about color theory. Yeah, you'd be shocked. They know how to use Photoshop <laughs> and they abuse it. And 
but I apply traditional art skills, and that yeah. is what if, takes if, you far. If, if it, you, the basic elements of art, composition, and design, and principles, that's what you need to be focusing right now, because Photoshop and what we do is just another tool, and if, if you, it, it doesn't mean anything if you don't know proper color theory and atmospheric perspective and human anatomy, you can't do anything if you don't know those things. And if you don't go to school, if, if you decide not to pursue, you can't stop learning. It's still important if you decide not to go to college or whatever, it's still important to find some mentors, to find an apprenticeship, to learn from a professional, uh, because you, you can't stop learning. I mean, that we're always learning, uh, so. And you really learn the most when you put yourself out there. I mean, really, I learned, I learned the fundamentals in school, but I didn't really understand them until I started teaching kids myself. Yeah. And until I started, you know, I got my job with Marvel probably before I was ready, and, um, it threw me in and I immediately, had, you know, I'm piddling along doing one page a day and then I got a job with Marvel and I'm under contract and it's publishing deadline and pretty, and I was expected to do two or three pages a day. And so I, that really, I had to pick up the pace and I learned so much just in the first year from that and the experience. Yeah, that's another thing. I think if you take that leap of faith. Take and, risk. Yeah, take, take a little risk and put yourself out there and just say, if someone says, well, we need you to do this, you know, piece of work and you're like, oh man, I. I can only do a page a week, and they want me to do five pages a week. Well, I mean, don't say no. Just say yes Just and make it happen. Just put yourself in it and do it. <laughs> uh, and, and, and yeah, so the first couple of months might be really rough. You might be working you know, 20 hours, you know, 15 hours a day on something, but once you learn how to do it and do it again, it doesn't take as long. You're much better at it, so take, take those risks and, and say yes, and um, just don't let people take advantage of you. And yes, yes ma'am. I'll let you handle that. Well, um, as far as what I use, Photoshop, I work exclusively in Photoshop. I know there's other color artists who work in Painter and Illustrator, but I only deal with Photoshop, and that's what I'm familiar with. And we use uh, drawing tablets, and we use uh, Wacom. And we use the ones that he showed you earlier. Basically, it's my computer screen. I can draw right on it. So it's just, it feels very traditional to me, and that's why I like it. But you can also get much cheaper as a student. You can get on eBay and get a very small tablet that you draw on it and you look at your compu computer screen for, you know, 40 bucks or something used, you know. So don't feel like, oh, well, if I don't have this expensive equipment, then I can't do this and be discouraged because really it's about your, your talent. And if the talent is there, I mean, you can use crayons and turn it. You, could, you can make art. You can do what you do out of whatever you're given. And so that's where you need to start. And once you become a, a sound artist and are familiar with good composition design and color theory, then and you can start making a little bit of money here and there. Because what I did, I started out with just a old, a very, you know, very cheap used uh, Mac, you know, uh, not even a MacBook Pro. I mean, it barely got me along and I got like a $30 tablet I bought off of eBay and that's what I used. And when I got my first paycheck in, I upgraded. And I bought a new a MacBook Pro. And then when I got my next paycheck, I upgraded to the, the small Cintiq, which is the one you draw out on. And then I got my big contract, and I bought the, the massive thing that's you know, huge that I could draw on. So that's the steps you take. And yeah, we didn't build the studio overnight. It was like a process. Yeah. yeah. And, so, and I think you had a question name? over here in the black shirt. Okay, yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I no, and and I think it's because we've um, at least everyone my age that I meet. I mean, I know a lot of people. I have a, a friend of mine named Eric Jones who works. Um, I met him because he would come to comic book conventions, but he was really a fine artist. He just started doing some covers. Um, he's an illustrative fine artist, um, like a figurative illustrative, but he shows in galleries in New York. And uh, 
uh, but he would take on comic book cover work, and he blended the two media uh, as if th there was no line or barrier between the two at all. Um, and I think it comes from the cult, our, our, our context and our age group because we all, you know, we grew up consuming these, we, we are a pop culture, or a pop culture generation, you know, we grew up consuming this stuff, and I think we all have that same context. So I think if you meet, you know, an artist uh, that's, you know, 35 and under or 40 and under or whatever, I think you have so many, you're, you're coming from the same place. And I think the, the, the line has been dissolved in many ways. At least that's the feeling I get. And the quality of the art and what you can do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And the, and the quality of comics, uh, it's not always true across the board, but it's, the quality has really gone up in comics. And they've sort of like met in the middle, I think. Um, so it's, um, and also, well, yeah, I really do think that the line is, has been not totally eradicated, but it's really been washed out. So, and I think that was our last question, right? All right, we're, we're, we're closing it up. Thank you guys so much for being here. Good luck to all of you. And you can see he's good at tap dancing, too, because it took us a while to get the, the presentation working, so another art. But you know, the one thing I see when we see these artists here is the compulsion that it's not enough to want to draw, you have to draw. And the people who are successful are people that that's their life, they have to do it. And they'll pay any price to get to that point. So again, that was an absolutely wonderful presentation. And uh, Mitch Elizabeth, thank you very much. All right, now uh, the part you've all been waiting for, it's going to be the, the slideshow of all the winning artwork. Uh, one thing I will say, when we're done with that, the next step is we're going to meet on the Capitol steps to take a picture. We have this uncanny ability of picking the hottest day of the year <laughs> to go outside and stand on white steps. Uh, but So the quicker we do it, uh, the better off we'll all be. You'll just follow the staff with the t-shirts and they'll lead you over there. And then the house photographers just listen to them because they organize big groups all the time and they'll do it well. So as soon as we're done, follow the staff out and you'll get to the steps. And now without further ado, I'm happy to present your artwork.
All right, obviously that was a quick glimpse, so make sure you do get to the hallway and see the actual artwork, because that's the real treat. All right, so let's work our way out of the room, follow the staff with the shirts, and we'll meet over at the Capitol Steps.